Okay, excellent. It's been recorded. So, John, welcome. Dr. John Banman. I'm very excited to have this conversation today. And I would like to start with um, you and a little <clears throat> bit of a story, your life story. Uh, if you had a couple of minutes to share kind of an executive summary about John Banman, how you happen to be here now and, you know, your life trajectory journey, what would you share with us? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, anyway, let me try. Uh, first, I want to tell you, I was born in the Ukraine. And uh, over, during the World War II, and so uh, from the Ukraine, and I was in our family, we were uh, outsiders. We were Mennonites, Dutch Mennonites that had settled in the Ukraine in the in 1980s, the 1800s. And so we were, we were there farming in the Ukraine. From there we went to, I went to, during the war, I went to Poland, from Poland to Germany, and from Ger Germany to Canada. I came to Canada at the age of 13. And um, by that time I had talked to Ger Dutch and I had talked, a lot of talk Polish and I looked, had been taught uh, Russian and I had been taught German. So my, Fifth language was English. So here I come into Canada with no money, poor as can be, and uh, settle down and start going to school. And uh, it started in grade six, I think, at the time. And then I went to high school and in high school, I discovered uh, Plato and I discovered Aristotle and I discovered Sigmund Freud, and I got very fascinated with that. But it was very, very conflictual with my religion. So I heard that in India, they, they, they could put religion and philosophy together. That was very fascinating point because that would have resolved my conflict between, will I stay with my religion or will I study philosophy? in psychology. And so I decided that I would go to India and I studied, I was in an ashram, in the Hindu ashram for 10 months, studying the yoga, the Advaita Vedanta really, the basic philosophy of the Upanishads and the, the Rig Veda. And uh, then I came home and continued my studies at university. And, uh, became a, a counselor first, high school counselor. Then I became in charge of all of the high school counseling in Manitoba, the province of in Canada. And then finally I became, uh, during that time, I met Virginia Satir. Okay, but before that I had already got my doctorate and so I then started learning from Satir. That's what I would say in my little history. <laughs> That's wonderful. And it kind of leads naturally to Satir, but before, before we uh, go into that route, I would like to also ask you if um, you allow us to know a little bit about your personal history in terms of your family. Um, if you have uh, and grandchildren, children, uh, what your uh, connection, where they are, and how you apply, if anything, uh, what you have learned to your personal life? Well, see, first I need to put you some timeline. I never got to know my grandparents because my mother was 45 when I was born. So my grandparents had already died when I was born. So I had my parents, and then I had six siblings, and I was the youngest, of course. And uh, so in that family, we were pretty close together. 
before we got to Canada, my father died. So in Germany, so we had, a, I had a brother and a sister and myself and my mother, we came to Canada. And so uh, we uh, tried to establish our own life here. Okay, now then of course I get married and we had some children and I now have some grandchildren. So, uh, and grandchildren are about two, the oldest are going to university and the old, youngest is only 12 years old. So family is uh, important, but more at the, uh, like, the quiet. We don't do great things together. Right? Yeah. We went to Mexico together. We went to the Alaska cruise together. The, this, these, we have, we went to Disneyland together. We went to uh, Hawaii together. We make family a sort of a big issue. Every day does every day type, everybody does his own thing, but then we have a big celebration. I don't know if that answers yeah. your question. Yeah, it's wonderful. So you do have, because it's interesting how people choose different um, professional fields. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we choose something that is closer to our heart. So, you know, we say this um, different phrases, you know, like we, we do what we want for ourselves. So for example, I chose my profession, I believe, because of um, my family dynamics. And I would love to explore that through professional, but also personal settings. So it's something that gives a bit of context in terms of why family therapy, why Virginia Satir versus other, um, at that time known, well-known masters and uh, philosophers and uh, writers and experts. Why did you choose uh, to follow the Satir model and Satir Virginia herself? Yeah, that's a good question because I had I had worked with uh, um, Glasser, you know, closely Bill Glasser. I had had some contact with Bill Har uh, Tom Harris about you know to transactional analysis. I had uh, some co good contact with Carl Rogers, and so there were others in my life that uh, were somewhat you know the big shots in 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 therapeutic world aspect of it. So I wanted, I think that I like telling this kind of story, this little vignette here. I uh, had just finished my doctorate in January, 1970. And, <clears throat> and my program was very rigidly Rogerian. So, you know, I didn't know at that time, that was just the right thing. You couldn't ask questions, but you could tell people how they felt. It was uh, it was pretty very much but you're Rogerian. And in June 1970, that's about five, six months after I graduated, I had a five-day residential workshop with Virginia Satir. And Maria Gamori was part of the, the students. So uh, whom I already knew a little bit before that. And this is in Manitoba, Canada, five days. And what convinced me so much, I think, is that she could bring about change in a matter of minutes. And there was, so that was a very interesting kind of dynamic because in, in Rogerian thing, that wasn't really the goal to bring about instant kind of thing. And it was experiential. And with my background of religion and uh, Hindu stuff, experiential was a very important component of life. Even though I was so-called scholarly minded, it was still the experience that was counting. So I was, I was blown away, I think. I was just blown away by her magic, we called it magic at the time, what she was doing, and we hit it off well. For some kind of reason, we, we bonded at an emotional level as well, and uh, we, uh, we promised we would work together uh, at 
at mine on our first uh, meeting with her. Wow, and you worked indeed. I mean, I was just looking at the uh, book that um, you um, authored together with Maria and Jane and Virginia. Tell us a little bit about that. That was 30 years ago, John. And uh, <laughs> 90, 30, actually um, 31 years ago. So tell us a little bit about your work with Virginia and the satire model. Okay. Now, let me tell you a little bit how that happened, the background. We, Virginia Satir was doing months long training programs in Colorado for at least 10 years, here 1981 to 1988. And uh, she would have triads working together as part of the breakout room. Like now we have a breakout room, we would have breakout groups. She would take 90 people every year as her group of students. And then she would have three groups uh, brought into groups of 30. And those 30 would each get a triad. And we, Maria Gomori and Jane Gerber and I became a triad. And Virginia had planned that each year, each summer, we would circulate. We would, work with everybody because she said, you now must work with everybody because if you can't, you have some unfinished business and you might as well use that as your way to grow. But when the second year came along, we decided, uh, Jane was our, our star, not Maria, not John, but Jane. Jane was the leader of our triad for sure. And she decided, I think, I'm not letting go of these two after the first year. And so we did, we became the permanent triad for these summer institutes. When, we, when she did a second level of uh, training, we became the senior faculty for that. So that was the setting. So we would work together. Well, Maria and Jane are not necessarily great scholars, so they weren't thinking about writing a book, but I was. And so one Sunday morning, we were having lunch or brunch together, and I invited them, would they be willing to write a book with me about the satir model? Well, Jane said yes, and Maria said no. Maria said, I've never written anything, I'm not gonna have anything to do with, but I'll help you, I'll help you. I wanna get, I wanna stay involved, but I don't wanna be the co-author of it. Well, she got hooked, very well hooked, and became very much a, a, the driving force of writing that book. So we would sit together and talk about it. And then I would go home and put it together and then we'd talk about it. And then I would go home and put it together and so forth. And in the meantime, I would take the manuscripts to Virginia Satir. And I would say, okay, this is what we have here and this is what we have here. So Virginia Satir saw the first six chapters out of 12. She never, she had, the, you know, the book got published in 1991. So it was three years after she died. So we worked on the book together and published it. And uh, there it was. Wow. And you had 12 chapters written all together uh, with the conclusion. Yeah. So you, you really did a, a good job. What do you think of this book? Uh, how, how do you... How do you think of it now, 30 years past? Well, I've been wanting to revise it many times, but both Jane and Maria said the Bible hadn't been revised. This book shouldn't be revised. It was a very bad comparison because Maria Virginia Satir's books were revised. Conjoint Family Therapy has three editions. Uh, People Making has two editions. So we never got it revised. There were some things that I would definitely have changed immediate, almost immediately. One of them is family rules. How family rules get changed is much deeper than saying sometimes, maybe, uh, you know, maybe not. Kind of open it up for and uh, not as a must, but I could. That is not a very good level of change. Change is much deeper than that. I would have been the first big thing I would have changed. But by now, a lot of other things have happened. I would, 
I would have, I wish we would have revised it and put in some more of the spiritual part, you know, that she's talking about at the end of her new people making and some more of the, uh, the uh, quantum physics that she intuitively had, the neuroscience stuff that she had intuitively had. We now have the science base. It would be much more scientifically uh, supported by what we know now, that which we didn't know then, but she somehow knew. So it's still, I still like it. I sometimes am surprised reading it, how we actually could have thought about those things. And yeah, anyway. Yes, I uh, still like it. It's one of my favorite. And yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, I have two other books that I would like your opinion on. So Conjoint Family Therapy, the classical book that was very uh, successful and, and shaped uh, also the uh, family therapy field. And your book, uh, or edited by you, the transformational Satya Transformational Systemic Therapy. Tell us a little bit about this, and what is the difference, the main difference, and uh, how are they sort of evolving into um, what's <clears throat> current uh, been taught? Well, the but conjoint means together. Remember, it was against the rule that you only saw one member of the family. And if you would see one member and I would see one member, we were not allowed to exchange notes. That was the psychoanalytical school of the day. So she wanted to do family therapy conjoint. That meant people would be there at the same time. And in the book, I think should we talk about her meeting the first family, how it happened, yeah. or how she happened, and they were going to charge her. Uh, anyway, so from the beginning, the big thing, the big initial thing that Satir did, and others did too, and they didn't seem to know each other, but for a while, they wanted to bring in the whole system, the whole family. So conjoint family therapy became the thrust, conjoint, kind of seeing the family together. At that time, when they conjoint family, therapy book was published. She was working with Gregory Bateson and Gregory Bateson and his group at the MRI, uh, they were looking at communication. So it was very much of, to me, a very much of a communication model, how to communicate. And uh, then it became more, uh, later, it became more of a positive drive. So I sort of look at it Satir started with communication and then went into, I don't want to look at pathology, so I will look at it as, as a human potential, human growth model. And then we, she said, okay, we can work more on change. You know, we're changing, changing how we perceive things, how we, how we feel about things. And then transformational therapy is basically who we are. So, but she had the ability, it was always there, but I don't think we saw it. So we, it wasn't so much as we added something new, we discovered her depth. And in terms of her idea of what life is all about. So it's more of a, who am I? You know, as part of that bottom of the iceberg, it became more a focus on who you are instead of just how you communicate or how you express yourself mm -hmm. in a, an emotional, mental level. So it's, 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 to me, it's like we discovered more of what she taught than we initially saw. Mm -hmm. Long well, answer. We'll come back to this in a bit, but uh, I also wanted to get your thoughts on another classic uh, hit of uh, of all times, the uh, new people making. It's been translated into many languages. Actually, um, now I'm in Greece and um, I saw an a Greek version and a lot of therapists who study currently, they know Virginia Satir from the translated uh, into Greek uh, book of hers. What do you think of this book? And if you were to just summarize uh, 
um, what would that be? Let me tell you a story. First, Virginia Satir started her career in teaching. And she was a teacher in a class where there were many grades. Uh, so she, I think she was actually in at one time a one room, one room teacher, one room school in some place. And so she had to learn how to teach people at different levels at the same time. So to me, that book is written in that kind of perspective. So can, you can read it if I look at a comparison. You can read it at, as a grade one book. You can read it as a grade three book. You can read it as a grade five book or six, whatever the elementary schools were about it. And so I feel that anybody can get something out of that book because whatever they're bringing, they can be met in the book. It is so cleverly done that I think some people even miss the idea that it is written in, in at least three different levels. So, so for me, that is, the, that is one of the values of that book. That's why I feel so many people like it because it, they tune in to the level of how they can understand the book. The other <laughs> thing that, that I would add is if, if you look at the end, end of the chapter of the book, she has a whole chapter on spirituality. And that to me has been extremely, that wasn't, that wasn't in the original book. That has been a real good base for us to expand the spiritual aspect of her model. So I- And I my, felt like reading that book, right? It's, <coughs> you are frozen. The connection is bad. No. You, Can you I hear, didn't, hear me now? Yeah. You were just froze. Okay. Oh, no problem. Okay. I was just going to say this book, um, you're <clears throat> right, it is so well written, so easily understood by many people, uh, not necessarily in helping professions, but just people who are interested in improving their relationships and their families. But also it felt like Virginia was ahead of her time when she put this spiritual aspect where, you know, there was no research on neuroscience, on quantum physics, on uh, on this uh, sort of met meta um, uh, research on on um, how things work spiritually, but she definitely uh, looked at you know these perspectives of um, for different perspectives. And what I appreciate about her um, is that she was a woman with no PhDs, right? Like she had no. Um, doctorate in a sense, but she had self-esteem so beautifully uh, strong that her confidence was strong enough to go into the men's world of psychology, of psychiatry, of uh, therapy, and put a stick on to the ground and say, this is how we should be doing uh, communication, family, relationships, and I think a lot of people, even now, feel inspired by that kind of uh, approach where there is no hierarchy, which was the uh, sort of foundation for all relationships. And she looked at children, and that's what I would also like to talk to you about uh, uh, you know, in a different kind of sense, because as a parent, I know uh, the model, but I struggle sometimes to follow the seed model because the hierarchical model is so strong and this piece of discipline, this piece of you know, role taking and making sure you know, children listen to parents. And this is a, a big uh, hot potato, you know, in, in currently in the parenting discussions. How do we follow this beautifully written model where we should look at every human being equal to the other, but at the same time, allow the family to function and to be uh, properly, uh, you know, set together to reach certain goals. And I, I know that Virginia had, had fostered uh, children, but she didn't have her own children. What do you think of, of that piece? And um, 
what would be your advice? Well, okay. To me, it's like we're, we're, we're confusing two roles. One of them is who I am, and the one is my role. At the being level, we're equal. We're equal value. We're the, and at the role level, we're not. And what I find is people confuse. They become the role. And when they wrote, they become their role. I'm the parent now, so I'm Haraku. I have a higher role than you. I forget the other role is that we're equal. And so I need need to find people who can be both. I have treat me and my children and whoever else the whole, you know, all the uh, the cultural things. I treat them as equal value in my heart. This is equal value. But in my role as a parent, I have a different role. So we confuse role and being, and then we get into trouble. And I think Virginia Satir made this, uh, made this distinction that we are at equal value. And then some people say, how do you mean we are equal value? Because they immediately go into the role part. Mm -hmm. So if, if I can stay with who I am, at the more spiritual level, even not just the psychological level, but at the spiritual level, that we're the same, then I can play a different role and not get hooked up. I don't, I don't lose my identity of who I am in my role. Mm -hmm. Very, very fascinating. Very good, very good point that you bring up, that we really want to know how to implement that. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's very um, interesting and fascinating as a topic currently, as we're uh, most of us in individualistic societies, but some of us from the collectivistic collectivist uh, cultures uh, finding themselves now with sort of liberated ideas. You know, um, now of course we know. We shouldn't uh, punish our children, should not beat them, should not scold them, should not abuse them verbally or whatever. But there's a very few models that actually provide practical guidance on how to create uh, safety, stability and discipline as well for children um, in the way where the roles are separated from the self, but the self is full of self-esteem. I think the Satir's model is one of the, for me, one of the very few that actually um, is true to that concept. And I wanted to talk um, a little bit about just a couple more books. If I could get your um, also feedback about Michelle Baldwin, uh, Step by Step Satir, A Guide to Creating Change in Families, and also the Satir Process, uh, by Sharon Lush, the um, small book, easy to implement for therapists and counselors. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I if you look at uh, step by step, uh, my name is actually mentioned in the uh, in the acknowledgments there. So I was I was around when that book was being uh, finalized for uh, for publication aspect of it. And remember that uh, that was a time when we wanted to be very much on the positive side. We wanted to move away from the psychopathology part to being more human aspect of it. So it was very much a, a challenge, I think, to the, the psychiatric uh, approach to therapy in terms of that. So it was a very nice kind of aspect of it. But again, I was uh, last year, Last year, I, when I was staying at home, I couldn't go anywhere. I was rereading all these Satir books that, that I could find. So I, I was reading the books that she had, she had written that you've already mentioned. And then I read the books that she had written with somebody else. And then I was reading the books that somebody else had written about her. And when I was reading the first book that you talk about, it was like, Oh, there are again signs that there's depth there, that you can really find more there than meets the eye kind of thing. So I was very impressed with that 
kind of acknowledgement. So I can see some people reading it and say, oh yeah, we communicate here and we look at everything as positive. And so we can go on that path. Or some people can go a little deeper and say, oh, that means I have to change my perception. I have to change my view because we are different. We are life energy manifesting in human form and we need to live at that level. So to me, again, it's that, that idea that, that you know, if you listen to Mozart, you might understand all the intricacies and I just like the lightness of it all. So that ability to do it in writing is marvelous. So I like that. The second book by, by Sharon Lotion, she talks, she's more practical, very, very practical. She takes the idea and says, okay, here's step one, two, three, here's, here's the idea. She, she takes the, the, the um, high level or deep level of thinking and puts it into a skill kind of thing. So once you have, once you have that experience, of who you are and you are in this spiritual kind of phase and now you want to go and apply it then Sharon's books would be very very good but mm -hmm. if you don't if you don't hear that spiritual part then some people might take it so simple like mm -hmm. a technique like LLP, NLP or so so I feel that people need to know that she's coming that Sharon has that vision that that experience and she comes from that deep level, but mm. she makes it very practical. So mm. pretty good. Yes, practical skills for therapists indeed. So that I also, um, I agree this is a good base for uh, a technical uh, skill-based um, process that sometimes therapists need just like a protocol, you know, and, um, maybe it's not the first book to start with. It's good to have a few um, with a broader context. And it's interesting that you said about step-by-step step being more um, what we now have a field called um, solution-focused therapy, right? That is very much positive-oriented uh, and the, the whole psychology field, positive psychology, now embraced, I think what Satir um, had alluded to and how to move towards the future, looking at the present moment and capitalizing on the past, more like reframing, rephrasing, you know, miracle questions. But it's almost like there's, there's, a, there, there's a, a fusion of different fields. There's an Adlerian uh, process of uh, family sort of, uh, piece that they, they were seen together rather than separately and a family reconstruction process. Actually, I have a, a couple of books on the family reconstruction. I wanted to ask you your opinion. Um, there's also Nairn's book uh, on family reconstruction. That's been a very popular process um, and not a lot is written currently these days about it. But um, there's an, an interesting sort of direction that now moving away from pathology and towards the um, possibilities, coaching, and now we uh, just got the program of satire coaching, also moving towards that possibility uh, rather than pathology. Um, and generally NLP and broader coaching, I think sit uh, on that foundation that satire uh, had laid out for uh, with NLP, with help of John Grinder and Richard Bandler. But I would love to hear your thoughts about uh, the future of satire, as well as that sort of um, a fusion of different approaches, Adlerian, solution-focused, maybe also uh, emotion-focused that Dr. Sue Johnson is now taking the lead on, and IFS, the Internal Family Systems by Richard Schwartz, and Bert Hellinger's Family Constellations, they're all sort of coming uh, from uh, to the surface from the depth of Satya work and some credit her work some don't but I, I would love to hear your thoughts about this different facets of Virginia and moving forward where do you see that okay let me go to uh, another level and then come back to it I went to India and uh, taught family therapy Satya and they said Satya must have been a Hindu she just got to be a Hindu kind of thing. 
And then I went to Thailand and I was there for quite a while, many years. And they said, she must have been a Buddhist in a aspect. I was invited to go to, uh, to, uh, to some Islamic countries, Malaysia, for instance, I was, and they say, oh, no, no, she was, she could have been a Muslim kind of thing. So what does that say to me? And then, you know, I think you'll see the, the connection. What she says, she's beyond these specific kind of aspect of it. She's higher than, she incorporates all of them. She's, but she's beyond it. When I look at all these people that you're talking about, they all have a piece of it. They all have a piece of it. And uh, when you look underneath it, it and or you want to go beyond it, you might have to use satir because satir covers the whole umbrella of what they're talking about, maybe even better than they do. But they take one, one branch and they make it into the whole tree and, uh, and people like that. So they need to, they have that, that they can have a handle on it. But on the long run, we're gonna have to have a higher aspect of it. So it's like, instead of having a, a uh, we wanna have a new compound in chemistry. We wanna build a new, new kind of uh, uh, creation out of it. So I think what somebody, like maybe you, will take it and you will take the whole thing and say, now look, we will incorporate all you're having, but we will integrate it and it will be a new form. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, I already started looking into it, but uh, we'll have another conversation about that in the, in, in the future. And what are your thoughts about um, uh, Virginia sort of uh, legacy, but moving forward, you know, the latest book by uh, Barbara Joe, um, uh, Well-Being Read Large, The Essential Work of Virginia City. I found it quite um, deep and practical and factual, and I wanted to ask your opinion on it. Well, you know, she, Barbara Joe Brothers really had a lot of knowledge you know she was the editor of this um journal uh, and then she would call virginia all the time so there was i don't think there was ever a, an issue that didn't have satire in it because she would ask me many times do i have permission to quote you there and you have permission if you look at it there are so many references to it she would say permission granted by john bandman aspect of it so she has a great good uh, good uh, understanding the the psychological understanding of uh, satire so i really like that and she she quotes her more than you know most people do you know she really verbatim quotes her in terms of that so i think that's a very good helpful book i don't think it's a a, a starter book you know i don't i wouldn't recommend that as an, a beginning of a book if you want to find about satire read that book it's like now you are ready for a deeper understanding or a broader understanding and you're into it go for that but don't start i mean there are many other books that you already mentioned you know like new people making would be one of them and so so uh, so i'm glad she did it she put a lot of time in it and she has a lot of uh, knowledge about it and we're lucky to have it but not as a beginning book. Yes, for me. I, I agree. And there's also a couple of uh, more practical books, uh, um, like the satire approach to communication. We talked about that um, sort of um, stage of MRI connection to ba uh, Gregory Bateson. And uh, that was a workshop manual. It's an interesting sort of take on, um, on how Virginia works, also looking at the video footages and, uh, 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 verbatims. I also got interested in this uh, Virginia Satir, her uh, Life and Circle of Influence book by Laura Dotson and Maria Gomari. Uh, it's a quite a big volume yeah. <laughs> of, of work. And um, yeah, a couple of thoughts uh, on that one. Well, it's, you know, I was around when they were writing that and it, it's, uh, they, they, um, it's more, it's more about them than satire, 
is my my story, even though there's a little chapter on the history of satire or our biography that I think Barbara Jo wrote, but it's more about them, you know. So it's it's okay. I wouldn't I wouldn't see that as a textbook for people. It would be yeah. saying, okay, how do other people experience satire, and how did it impact them, and what did they do with it? So it's a, it's a a little nice little personal uh, um, exposure of how they applied it and how what it meant to them and so forth. But right. it sounds like you have almost everything that I have in terms of the books there. Yeah. Well, tell tell me more if there's anything else that you would recommend. I mean, I have also uh, a well, couple on satire well, family camp or. Um, yeah, no, how about uh, Andrea's magic? What does Andrea, Andrea, Steve Andrea's, what does he call, what does he call his book? Do you know, how, do you have that one? Andrea's? Very, okay, and Virginia Satir, The Pattern of Her Magic. I do don't actually know, but I have a bundler, uh, a structure of magic that yeah. mentions yeah. satire and also um, genius, uh, also their book about uh, sort of deciphering uh, and kind of an analyzing the methods of uh, satire, but I don't have this one that you mentioned, no. Okay, it's, so it's Virginia Satire, The Patterns of Magic, and it was published by Science and Behavior Books in 1991. Mm -hmm. Oh, same year as the satire model. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great, and I will look into that. And now, you already yeah. changing with families by again, Bandler and Grinder, right? Yes, yes. That, okay. um, now, what about uh, satire transformational systemic therapy? Could you just uh, share a little bit more and also um, the, you know, let's let's move from that into this whole notion of transformation and systemic part, because these are, um, you know, very sort of um, popular words these days. I think uh, now we are moving towards the process, kind of back into the future, uh, towards the process, <laughs> towards systemic change. And uh, uh, other therapies, especially integrative um, uh, modalities, they want to embrace that systemic part. Well, yes, systemic has been one of uh, Satir's secret uh, weapon all along. She's been interested in systemic for a long time. You know, she goes back to Krasipski and Brzezinski who wrote this very great book called Science and Sanity. And it was there in 1923. And people like me, she would bring that book to my attention. Now, some other people say it's, they never heard of it. Well, she, she, she was made sure that I read it and I was familiar with it. And I, I, I must admit of all the books I had looked at, I had never seen that. So I knew some of her basic structure of systemic stuff and how it worked on it. And she would try to explain it, I think, in very simple terms sometimes when it's really, really complex. And when you read Krzyzewski, you, you really need to be there in order to get the whole significance of it. So systemic to me has been a basic uh, uh, foundation for satire all along. She read the book when, when she was in high school. So she had a, a, a quite a, a, a early familiarity with a systemic kind of thing. So uh, that would be as that would be my 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 kind of take on systemic. In terms of transformation <clears throat> that I feel like we have one thing we haven't talked about is energy. And my sense is a transformation is operating at the energy level. It's mm -hmm. not just at the behavior level or even at the feeling level or perception level. All that could be put into change therapy. 
<coughs> when we start talking about uh, transformation, we need to bring in a deeper level, more Einsteinian kind of level of energy. And so to me, transformation is working at the energy level to bring about transformation. So we're not just changing direction, we're changing being, mm. how we manifest towards love. So to me, in a no question asked for me, Satir is a transformational therapeutic model. Mm. It helps people transform their energy. Yes. So yes. in a simple thing, in a simple form, that's been along for a long time, is that you go from a placating person to a congruent person. Mm. Well, when you look at that as a, as a goal, that really requires some transformation because that means you have to transform in energy. And most things are on a continuum. So it's not like you're a blamer today and you're congruent there. There's a continuum aspect of it. And if you reach the higher level of congruence or deeper level of congruence, then you have a sense that you're transforming something deeper than just your behavior, your feeling. So I like the idea of transformational therapy because that gives it a, a, a um, base that isn't very often talked about or even recognized that it's so deep. Mm -hmm. We're transforming energy into a positive or spiritual level. Mm, I it's love that. Beautiful. It it's is so beautiful. beautiful. And it, again, it just, uh, so many levels, you know, when you describe her, you know, she has this uh, part that is cognitive behavior part where she's very clear and directive and, and very much practical. And the behavior as a top of the iceberg changes naturally. There's also this piece of different techniques, but you know, now we know body mind, we, we know, um, you know, emotion focus, we know uh, even EMDR to some extent. I mean, all these different protocols and, and techniques, NLP, of course, and coaching, but then there's the, the whole piece underneath which is experiential, but also somatic, you know, for her, as she was very kinesthetic and touchy and huggy and, you know, very much present in front of the family and, and her clients, that sense of groundness, that mindfulness, that meditation piece, that Hindu sort of Vedic, Muslim, whatever, that source, that she was part of the energy that now we know mirror neurons right people next to her transformed maybe because she had that strong self-esteem and also the ability to see to validate to appreciate to accept the one in front of her so that a person feels like their self-esteem grows and transforms on the level of the source the energy the self that's so beautiful john that for me that's that's um a really nice part to to move a little bit into the fun. So I would love to ask you about, you know, if you were to leave 100 years more, what would you like to see happen in relation to city work? And what would be happening? Well, yeah, uh, okay, maybe I will answer it from the present first. Like, uh, where is the satire model now and where is it going kind of thing. And I think we're in the crossroad of it, really. I'm really concerned about that. Now I'm, I'm plugging away a little bit. And a new little, little door has opened recently where there's two people and I, three of us, are talking about what can happen. And some people say, I'll tell you what, what I hear mostly in the community. And then I'll try it. Your question is so big. I'll need to make sure I stay on the topic. Uh, when most people say we could continue to appreciate what we were given by Virginia Satir and just keep her gifts play themselves out. It just, just, okay. Leave, let it fade into history. Yeah. So when I talk to other 
professionals who aren't necessarily satire people, they say, okay, let it just go, let it just go. It's put, it's in history, she will remember it in history. There will be a little mention there, but just let it go. Uh, it'll fade into, into the, it's like taking some, uh, some uh, incense and putting it outside and it just dissipates in, in, the, in the world aspect. That's the, that's the general wish or recommendation of people in some kind of position like, uh, you know, International Family Therapy Association. That would be their position as an association to look at that. So the second one is what we're doing now. You know, we're, we're, we're having a, a global network and we're having getting get togethers and we have people uh, learn it in some simple kind of way or difficult way anyway. And we can stay that way. So we're just one of many, many, many kind of thing. As you already mentioned that, that whole list where we're just one of many and we're cer certainly not the number one at this time aspect to it. So then what we could do, and that's the third choice that we could stay, okay, we're going to now take it and move the whole satir model into the present. We can now show satir uh, how it's supported by quantum physics. We can now show how it's supported by neuroscience. We can now support it by, by energy level that we would take somebody, some buddies would take the whole model and raise it to a higher level so that we could become the centerpiece of therapy. What I, okay, I want to tell you a little story. I was listening to the psychotherapist conference, you know, the evolution of psychotherapy last September, mm -hmm. and they were talking about what's happening, what's coming ahead. And what's coming ahead, well, and don't fall off the chair, there's what's coming ahead is the new wave the new wave is going to be process. Okay. So for me, that's a big joke because now somebody has discovered that the new, that something we should have in our whole therapy should be process. Well, if satire is in process, it, it isn't, there's nothing there, right? I mean, experiential process are one of her core concepts of it. And now these people at the university, of course, they were advocating that we're coming into a new wave of therapy called process. Okay, so when you're saying, where, where is it going? Where do I see it in, in 100 years or even less than that? Uh, I could see it that if we, we build our team together and we say, okay, we're, we're gonna be the futuristic satir people. We're not just taking what she said, we're going to bring it into the central stage and put it into the present uh, time frame in the whatever, the quantum, quantum power, the quantum field time power, and therefore become the uh, integrator of so many of the things. So what other people will do, they will just provide a techniquey kind of thing. So they will provide like NLP, they could provide some in it, but it would be all under the umbrella of what we could call satire process model. Mm, powerful, wow. <clears throat> my my uh, bulbs of thoughts got lit and I was like, oh, that's interesting. You know, that's um, uh, the future is uh, sort of already happened and it's interesting it's like a fashion coming back you know people return in some form and shape but that sort of that's uh, a circle or spiral maybe a spiral tendency which is and about expansion and contraction it's part of our universality so maybe that's what's happening that's, that's powerful now, um, in the interest of time, I wanted to ask you a personal question to sum this up. If you were to describe your life journey in five words, what would these words be? Hmm. 
plan. I don't know. Whatever I say, I might change my mind about it later. So, <laughs> uh, um, I know. Uh, I think uh, curiosity. That would probably be the big curiosity, wonderment, awe. You know, like the way it's it's a miracle kind of aspect, awe, curiosity. Uh, uh joy joyfulness hmm. there's something you know the underlying thing i think would have to be love so i would take love curiosity uh, awesome awesomeness Beauty. Say again. Beauty, 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 beautiful. I don't know. How I, what do you make of that? I don't know. I had yes. never thought of it. You know, every time I ask different people who I meet and their answers are so different. I made a little journal of life stories in five words. And across the years, it's fascinating. It never fails to amaze me how different people descriptions in a way it's like a short narrative um that describes the life of you know what values you hold and also yeah. how how you are now describing yourself i understand how close you are to satir because i wonder what she would say what do you think she would say about her um i think she would say potential that I don't have, uh, that I didn't feel. I think she always saw potential, growth. Growth would be her, definitely. Love and growth, potential, uh, harmony maybe, even though she wasn't correctly musical, she might have used the word harmony. Uh, equality. Equality would be another one or value, yeah. Interesting thought. Beautiful, beautiful. Any other closing thoughts I uh, would like to share with those people who are watching this video and uh, hearing to this uh, dialogue, a fascinating discussion on uh, your life, satir, and the future of uh, possibly satir process model. Uh, they are probably professionals who either start started just recently with a satire or they come back to learn more and they they would like to be inspired. So closing thoughts, John. Well, to me is a, that uh, never give up kind of thing. Uh, look at the bright side of things. Things are possible. Um, you deserve a better life and it's up to you to create it that you have the ability to create your own happiness and uh, that we're going to survive thank you thank you I, we could have stayed for on, on a, every of these questions for another hour or more but the time for today's interview um, has come to an end. I would like to thank you for your presence, for your time, yep. for your willingness. And it's been a wonderful journey to get to know you a little bit and hear your voice and uh, share it also. Yeah, spill my secrets to the world. Yeah, you have a nice way of doing that. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay.